Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah, just gonna wait a few minutes. We had uh, a couple of people waiting in the in the waiting room there. That never seems to be uh, exactly the, the first attempt that works. So um, I'll just give it a moment, and uh, and then we'll get straight to this painting class, how to paint a candle. Um, I anticipate today's class to be relatively short, at least compared to some of the other classes. Um, there's, it's a, a fairly simple uh, composition here. And also the color scheme will be relatively uh, simple as well. So. Just gonna give it a, another few moments. For those of you who, um, if this is your first time painting in uh, one of these painting classes, um, welcome. My name is Mark Liam Smith. I'm a professional uh, artist. I am represented by three galleries for my oil paintings and, uh, and then I sell my digital uh, photography through a different gallery. But uh, I'm a, I've been a professional painter now for about seven years. And um, I have, in addition to these uh, online classes that we do here on YouTube, we also do um, Patreon and TikTok, and then of course the YouTube uh, channel as well. So if you are uh, interested in um, pursuing art, um, learning more about art, please do check out um, the rest of my TikTok. I do ha uh, upload these live lessons every week. Uh, immediately after the class, I will upload this class and uh, it's just so, you know, if I go too quickly, um, you can always go back and, uh, you know, pause it and, uh, and just paint along it in your own time and at your own pace. That's the idea anyway. For today's class, we're going to be going with three different sizes of uh, paintbrush. You don't need three sizes, you can make do with, with two, but I'm going to be using uh, a large, this is a, I think it's about a number 24 or something like that. Yeah, it's a number 24. Uh, and then a medium brush, you can have a four or a six, something like that. And then something like a detailed brush. You can see that you don't have to be pristine. Uh, this is just an oil study. So if we don't have a large, don't worry about it. Uh, we can certainly get the job done just with the two, a medium and a small. Now my medium sized brush happens to be a, what's called a square brush or a flat brush. Um, you can use any size, any shape for this. You could use a, a bright or a filbert, even an angled brush. Um, but uh, for the small, probably something like a round would do you best um, because we're gonna be painting things like the wick. And uh, so yeah, those two brushes at a minimum and then that will make your life uh, much, much more uh, easy if you have something to cover the, uh, the most of the canvas. So that's what you need for brushes. We'll get into uh, what paints you need in just a moment. Uh, we'll just let a couple more people come in the chat. And um, let me show you what I'm working with here in terms of my canvas. So for these studies, for these uh, art classes, what I do recommend, and uh, for those of you who've been here before, you will know that uh, I always plug in this amazing brand, Canson. They do an oil and acrylic paper. Um, so you get 24 sheets. It's a good size, nine by, excuse me, nine by 12 inches. What I really like about it is if the camera will zoom and focus on it, there we go. This is what I really like about this paper is that the texture of the paper mimics the texture of a canvas. I like it about, you know, a number 10, say cotton, just a, uh, a number 10 cotton duck canvas. So uh, there's a little bit of what uh, we artists call tooth, you know, which means texture. Uh, so that's great. Instead of spending, you know, doing a study on one canvas that costs you five, six, seven dollars, you can do um, just on one sheet of paper. The paper that I'm using for my palette here, you can actually buy this in a pad of paper and it looks, kind of feels like wax paper. That's really great. 
traditionally and typically uh, I paint with the my palette horizontal. I just put it vertical here so that you can see exactly what colors I'm using. So this is our subject today. This is my reference image. I just pulled a, an image of a candle off the internet and uh, I'm printed it out and I've just taped it up beside. Uh, so the plan today is we're going to cover the whole canvas uh, with this background color. And then I'm going to show you a technique pulling off or uh, rubbing out this idea. So you can, you're going to also need a rag. Uh, I'm using an old t-shirt, but you can use a paper towel if you want. So you will have to grab one of these um, before we get started. So the, what we're going to do is cover the whole canvas with the background color and then with a rag wrapped around our finger, I'm going to draw the shape of the candle and pull off all of the background color, leaving a silhouette of the candle, and then we're going to fill it in with color. That's the idea. So the uh, the t-shirt that you're using will be crucial, or uh, old sock, as long as it's you know clean. You don't want your painting st <laughs> stinking like like socks. Um, an old t-shirt, an old sock, something along those lines, or a paper towel will do as well. Typically, um, I would use a cloth and then just, uh, that tends to do the job. Okay, let's get going with the uh, that first pass, covering up all of the white. Now, usually I would use something maybe a little bit um, more like a mid-tone, like a sienna or an umber, but uh, the background, if we can make the background very dark, then by contrast, the flame will appear brighter. So let's go let's go as dark as we can, which uh, for our purposes is black. If you have a black, that's wonderful. Uh, if you don't have a black, don't worry about it. Um, you can just use any color that has a low value. So that that means uh, you know if you imagine the color to be a gray scale, then um, something like it something that would look dark gray, like sap green or dioxazine purple, um, alizarin crimson, any of those are really, really dark. And let me see. Okay, I, it doesn't really matter what black you go with. I'm going with Shrenigan black, it doesn't matter. You can go Mars or um, you know, any, any other black you want. You could go for a lamp black, whatever happens to be uh, kicking around. Um, now, in addition to this lamp black, I'm going to be a little bit sneaky and I'm going to add uh, just the smallest amount of blue violet. And um, just, to, just a touch. I, I don't want a blue violet background. I just want to have a little bit of blue violet in there. You don't have to do this step if you don't want to. I'm doing it because the, the blue violet will push the black just a, um, a little bit more toward the natural complement of all of these oranges that we're going to be painting. And um, by contrast then, by complementary contrast, you don't need to know what that is uh, for the purposes of this lesson, but um, it will make the oranges appear even more orange and even more vibrant. But uh, we don't need to uh, get into all of that just now. That, that's just uh, later on. Um, this is only the fifth class, so but later on, we're gonna get into a little bit more complicated color theory, but uh, we don't need to worry about that now. So if you do have a little bit of violet or blue, um, you are welcome to add that color to your black. Now I do want this to go on fairly uniform, so I'm gonna mix these together uh, with a palette knife. And while I'm doing that, just let me thank you all for joining again. This, this is our fifth painting class uh, and every Sunday, starting at seven o'clock. And, uh, you know, we have until 10 reserved, but barely make it till 10. Usually, even the most complicated subjects tend to do them in about two hours, two and a half hours. I can't see this painting going very long, probably an hour or less. Um, there's, it is quite a uncomplicated color scheme and uh, also, the composition is pretty simple. So 
So that's how you mix. So you scrape it all off, put it down, and then just kind of chop it up. Squish it in, scrape it off, push it in. Um, when you're mixing two colors or, or more together, I would recommend that you mix them more than you think is necessary. And uh, that's just a really good habit to get into. What you don't want to do is mix all your colors together and then end up in a position where um, you have a uh, one spot that's not thoroughly mixed and then it just affects the whole area. Definitely what I would call suboptimal. Okay, so we have this uh, black here now and you're gonna take your largest brush. I'm using a large brush here. This is a uh, 24, but if you have uh, just a small brush, then you can do that too. The idea is to uniformly cover your entire canvas. I wouldn't go directly with that. I would dip my brush into, I'm going with linseed oil. Um, if you have mineral spirits or turpentine or turpenoid, um, then you can go with that as well. Um, I typically don't use those um, thinners. I just go with linseed oil as a thinner as well. But um, when you add thinner like that, linseed oil or turpentine or turpenoids, what you're doing is thinning out the paint and you're also making it more fluid. Uh, more fluid also equals more transparent. So that's something to keep in mind and be aware of. It's in fact how you make glazes. But uh, I'm not doing, I, I, I don't need to do any of that right now. All I'm doing is worrying about getting coverage and just getting a nice fluid paint here. I don't want it sticking too much. I don't need it to be too thick. I am going to be rubbing it off with that rag, in, well, most of it anyway. Our patrons, I posted a uh, this week's uh, Patreon video just a few hours ago, so please go check that out. Um, it was uh, it's over 15 minutes long. It's it's the longest video I've posted, I think, on YouTube or Patreon, other than live replays. But uh, it was a pretty cool subject. I ended up taking a look at art books and showing you how to use them in a really creative way to analyze compositions in order to improve your drawing. So, um, yeah, and if you're not a patron um, and you'd like to join um, the, uh, the minimum tier, which does grant you access to all of the exclusive content, uh, is uh, just $2.50 Canadian uh, per month. And then, of course, there are other tiers with benefits uh, above that. But uh, you could check that out if you like at Mark Liam Smith. Uh, sorry, patreon.com slash Mark Liam Smith. So just cover your whole canvas. It doesn't need to be perfect, but do try to get rid of all of the white. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, I, I, uh, I wanted to do even more of them. I did three examples. And I just thought oh, I, I, I could go forever. Do, you know, I, I, I might do, I might do a YouTube video in a similar style in a few weeks time um, and just do a bunch of them because it was really fun to do as an exercise for me. And uh, I found it was just giving me ideas about composition that, uh, that I hadn't really thought about before with the balance and the symmetry of things. And, uh, and then just really starting to think about movement so, yeah, there's, I mean, they're, they're called masters for a reason, right? They, uh, I don't know how much of it is intended and how much of it we, we see in retrospect, but, yeah, wow. Just really incredible stuff from, from those uh, artists. I'm just using up the rest of this black. Please do try to 
get something of a reasonable uh, consistency. It doesn't matter, really. This is just a study. But, um, you know, sometimes you're doing a study and then it, if you're too careful with it, it becomes precious and then that's when things start to become a problem. Because when something becomes precious, you stop taking risks. And when you stop taking risks, you stop learning. And uh, that's a very dangerous place to be indeed, as an artist, to have stopped learning. I've finished with my large brush now, and uh, obviously, with all of the linseed oil here and uh, freshly painted paint, this is extremely wet. And um, that's the idea, because we're going to be removing a whole bunch of it in just a moment. I'm going to clear out my palette while I am here. Just going to rub some of that off. Yikes. Okay. So if we're all in the same spot, let's now um, take a look at the next step. This is going to be crucial, this next step, because we are going to be removing paint. We're gonna be pulling it off. Um, and we don't typically do a lot of this in our painting, but it is quite a powerful thing to do to your piece. Uh, if you are, in a, if you are uh, painting along with acrylic, I don't know uh, how you would mimic this move with acrylic unless you did it immediately after painting your acrylic and perhaps if you did if you painted with a lot of uh, slow dry medium and then just really jumped on it pounced on it um, I mean that's possible so but with oil um, we don't need to rush quite so much so just grab a, a clean area and you're going to fold it over a few times because you are going to be pulling off quite a lot of material. The idea here is that you, you want to take off as much as you can with one swoop and then find a fresh piece, fold, it fold over the dirty part, find a fresh piece, another big swoop, and so on. And every time you're pulling things off, you're pulling it off with clean um, material. That will uh, make it the easiest for you if you've never done this before. So my plan is I'm going to start at the top of the flame and I'm going to pull off the entire flame, not thinking about the candles first. And remember, this is just our reference. We're not trying to copy it. We're just using the ideas. So your flame doesn't have to be exactly that shape. It just has to be rounded at the top and thicker at the bottom. Let me start here. Okay. Now I'm gonna go create some width. basically drawing at this point. You're drawing uh, in, in a negative way, I guess you, you could say. Don't worry about drawing that wick. We'll put that in afterwards. Once you have your flame um, drawn out, you can work on the candle. Again, don't be concerned too much or at all about the shape of the reference candle versus the shape of your candle. This is where your individual taste comes into play. This is where you express yourself as an artist. Don't try to make it look uh, like mine. Just You're just taking the ideas. And the idea right now is to, is to remove black paint in roughly a rectangular shape, a, a candle shape. Of course, the, the sides are going to be straight and the top is going to be much more irregular. If you want to be um, particularly neat about 
removing the colors, you can dip your rag into the linseed oil or paint thinner and really take off all of the paint. Um, I'm not that concerned. I'm gonna leave a little bit of this black behind and um, it's gonna end up mixing in with the reds and the oranges. Uh, and that's totally fine. And uh, so I'll just give you another minute. Once you feel like you're in a good spot, you can just kind of think about the edges and touch up anything else you need and then put your rag down. Put it in a safe spot and uh, have a look at your hands. This is a, a perfect chance for you to have paint on your hands, which then you touch your face and then you end up walking around with paint on your face all day. Uh, a classic. Okay, we're at a good spot right now and we're ready to paint the object itself. The background is pretty much uniform and the foreground is ready to go. We, we need a plan for the the colors we need a plan of attack let me talk you through my thinking when approaching a subject like this and uh and then you know there are obviously many different ways to do it but let me uh, talk you through my thinking i divide this subject into two different paintings the candle the the, the flame and then the candle and for me i don't think it matters which one uh, that you paint first they happen to be the same palette, in this case, whites, yellows, oranges, reds. And then here, we don't really have any white or yellow, but a lot of oranges and reds. If the candle were a different color, greens and blues, then you'd really see that they, they are basically two paintings with two different palettes, but, um, but not in this case. Let me just uh, enhance my my flame a little bit more. I'm gonna make it just uh, a little bit bigger. Okay, so I don't think it matters too much whether we go for the flame or the candle. Let's start with the candle. It is slightly easier. What you're gonna notice is that the, there is a tonal gradient. Uh, so a gradient, by the way, means a, a slow shift from one thing to another thing. So there's a, a shift in the tone or the value from light to dark. As, as you move from the top to the bottom of the candle, it gets darker. We're gonna to have to reflect that tonal shift. Obviously we know why it goes, it gets lighter to darker because the light source is the flame, it's up at the top. So we'll have to keep that in mind that it's lighter at the top than the bottom. Now this is a candle and we're gonna presume that it is cylindrical. So a cylindrical object is closest to the viewer at the center, right here. What you typically see with that level of cylindrical object is that the part closest to you, which would be here at the center, is lighter. And the parts that are furthest, uh, farthest away, which would be the two sides, would be darker. However, in this case, because there's very little light source other than the flame, the whole candle appears to be um, flat. You're not getting a lot of that cylindrical action that you would see. So we don't really have to worry about having the, the center line of the candle brighter and the edges darker in order to show a cylinder. It's quite flat. I will note that there's a small dim line right here, and that looks like it might be from a secondary light source maybe some other candle or um, something else in the room. We don't have to put that in, but we can put that in if we like. Other than that, um, one more thing to note on the candle is that you have the smallest line across the lip of the candle here that's really quite bright, and it's a lot brighter than the rest of the candle. And another spot right at the back. Obviously, reflections of the flame uh, into the wax. We won't worry about the wick right now. Let's go for the candle. So you see that there's a strip about, uh, I don't know, a centimeter here, maybe uh, one and a half centimeters or uh, slightly more across 
the top of the candle that's quite um, bright oranges, and then we get into the reds. So let's go with that first. For my oranges, I'm going to go with uh, the incredible cadmium orange. This is uh, a highly uh, opaque orange with incredible tinting power. And um, this is sort of the, the standard bearer for oranges, much more chromatic than, you know, say permanent orange or uh, any of the other synthetic ones. This is made with real cadmium, which is of course a transition metal. And um, that has to be mined out of the ground and uh, ground up uh, makes the most incredibly vibrant yellows and oranges and reds uh, cadmium does. So we don't need much of it to do the trick. Now the some of the chroma will be knocked down. It'll it'll be desaturated slightly because we're not dealing with a strictly white canvas. We do have a little bit of black. And remember uh, from my other classes uh, that black is fundamentally a cool color. And when you mix cool colors with warm colors like orange and red and yellow, the, de the saturation level decreases. So we are gonna get Do you adjust color when you paint on black gesso as you as you can't wipe out? Um, no, I don't. No, the um, I the generally speaking, the colors that I the paints that I use um, when the when I'm using black gesso. Remember, the gesso would be dry, so so I'm just getting complete coverage um, on top of the black gesso. But no, I don't need to. Um, adjust the color at all because the colors that I use typically are very high quality paints and I get a, a good amount of coverage, especially things like this Michael Harding. So um, yeah, it's not a problem. If I did want to increase the chroma even more, and I typically don't, um, it, they're already bright enough, but if I did want to, um, I could go and uh, fill that in with, with uh, white and let it dry. But uh, for our purposes, it's gonna be okay. So uh, this color here is not quite like this. Um, this tonally at least is a lot lighter than this color. So when you want to uh, increase a, the value of your orange, you have two choices. You can either uh, tint it, which means adding white, or you can step up the uh, color wheel and uh, to the, to the to the hue that is one value higher. So in that case, yellow um, or a combination thereof. So I'm gonna add a little bit of yellow. And um, typically you're gonna add yellow instead of white. If you wanna keep your chroma eye, you can add white if you um, don't mind. But the problem is when you add dark, um, cool colors with orange and white, you tend to start getting skin tones, uh, you know, and that's, not always desirable. Let's go for um, mostly an orange candle. I have that medium brush. You can see that the, uh, this is an older brush, so you don't need anything really precise. I'm just gonna add a little bit of, uh, of this cadmium yellow to it and find a color somewhere between the two of them. Remember, we're gonna go light to dark as we move down the candle. So let's start with some of our lightest colors. I'm gonna find the lip of the candle. I've just kind of drawn a line now and you see these bumps that are behind the lip, they're, they're on the other side of the, of the flame. And they're gonna be slightly darker. So I'm gonna come back to them in a few moments when I have more black on my brush. I'm pulling that orange and yellow down as I move down. I don't wanna pull any of the black up into, into my color. I want to pull the orange down into the black. Uh, when it seems like you're not, your paint's not doing much, you can reload. 
doesn't really matter how bright or how light your orange is right now. What matters is how light it is relative to what's underneath. So wherever you started, you have to go darker as you move down. It's not going to be too much of, of an issue. We did start fairly light. I'm just going to bring it all the way across to keep that whole level consistent. Okay, and now that I've used this color that's somewhere between yellow and orange, I'm going to wipe off my brush, dip it in the linseed oil. Uh, either is fine. And now I'm going to go with just that orange. Don't blend it in all yet. I, you see, I'm I'm adding the orange below. What I like to do is add it below and then blend the two together. Instead of painting right up to the line, I like to work my way up to the line. And uh, that's typically a more careful way to do your blending. But uh, it's up to you. There's It's just a, a matter of personal taste. I'm going to the line and I'm dragging down. I'm not pushing the paint up. I don't want to contaminate the, the colors that I already have on there. So I'm going, I'm starting at the line and I'm bringing it down, starting at the line, bring it, bring it down. And that way I'm going to get a, a more consistent blend. This is one of those uh, parts of the painting where you could spend a while going back and forth and back and forth and just really trying to get that blend perfect. And uh, personally, that's, that's a part that I enjoy. I really like spending a lot of time and making sure I have everything um, the way I want it, but uh, it's up to you. You can do a, a really kind of a quick blend you can go back and forth. You can add, if you've put too much dark orange um, up in the top part, you can just use some, add a little bit of yellow and that's not a problem at all. So I'll just give you a moment. Um, I, sh I haven't mentioned it yet, but I should mention it. If I'm at a stage and I'm ready to move on to another step and you need another minute or two, just drop a note in the comments. I'm happy to wait. This isn't a demonstration. It is a painting class. so. You know, unfortunately, we're not in a position where you can just say, um, shout something out loud or, or put up your hands sort of thing. So, um, yeah, just drop me a note in the comments and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to hang on for a few moments. The next color down is, um, after orange, is cadmium red. Now, if you don't have cadmium red light, you can just use cadmium red. And, uh, and mix cadmium red with cadmium orange. You can still, you can create this color. I'll just kind of graphically demonst uh, uh, demonstrate with the props. So cadmium red light sits visually on, you know, on the color wheel directly between cadmium red, which is also called cadmium red medium and cadmium orange. So you can mix this one by mixing that with that in equal parts because they have the same tinting strength and the same opacity. So 50-50 will get you exactly halfway through. Um, this cadmium red light is really great because it reads like cadmium red in bright, in bright light. So I'm going to go with a small amount of that. There's not going to be much cadmium red. We're going to transition out of it very quickly. Um, and then, of course, 
the incredible cadmium red. I'm dipping my brush in linseed oil and wiping it on that rag. Now with a clean brush, I'm gonna do the same thing with this cadmium red light. I'm gonna create a line all the way across and then start blending by going up to this line and pulling it down. Just pulling it down. Don't worry about the transition. If you're not getting in a smooth transition, you can work on that. Focus more on getting the, the entire width of the candle, um, uh, the, the same treatment all the way across. Okay, there's a line there that we're gonna to try to blend out. So I'm gonna pull back some of that cadmium orange and mix it in with that cadmium red light just below that line. And then very lightly, this is the, this is the secret, you have to go very lightly Take your time when you're doing these delicate blends. It's really easy to overdo it, to overshoot. And uh, and if you do, it's, it's almost like oversteering a vehicle. You have to steer more than you want in order to get back kind of to a middle um, level area. So if you, if you, go too dark and then you have to add a lot of light just to get back to a middle tone. That's okay. That's why we're here. We're here to practice that. Notice I'm doing all my blending in a horizontal way. If you, if you blend vertically, you're going to go through too many different tones like this. That's going to be really dangerous because you're going to go through a whole bunch of different tones. So you don't want to do that. You're going to lose all of that work. Okay, let's move now to the cadmium red, our darkest. And maybe we'll do one more tone underneath cadmium red. like we might have room for it. I'm just blending darker and darker colors. If you wanted to do this with a candle that was uh, that had cool colors, you could go greens into teals and turquoises and then into blues. That would be pretty good. Or you could start with teals and turquoises and go blues and then end up with indigos um, and that sort of thing. And you have to be really careful just when you're going across the, um, the warm color to cool color barrier. But if you stay with all warms or all cools, um, you, generally speaking, you get a pretty good result. It's pretty easy to blend those. Uh, in this case, of course, we're going just with warm colors. Red and cadmium red light and orange and orange yellow. And then even our yellow happens to be quite warm. It is, of course, cadmium yellow, which is a warm yellow, as opposed to something like cadmium yellow lemon, which is a cool color, or cadmium chartreuse, which is another cool color. Okay, we are now at, um, not quite at the bottom of the candle, but we're at the darkest we can get here. So I think maybe a little bit of that black 
if you have any left. I don't. Um, but if you mixed some black with that red, that would probably do the job. And then the candle will sort of just fade into the background at the bottom. I'm gonna mix the cadmium red with the black. Um, you can actually buy this color. It's called cadmium, cadmium red deep. And uh, it's not quite this black, but it is the darkest version of a cadmium red. Um, I have it somewhere I can show you. Here's, uh, here's the set. Cadmium red light, then cadmium red medium, also known as cadmium red, and then cadmium red deep. So these three colors are all uh, in uh, an analogous color wheel. And then the next one would be cadmium orange deep, and then cadmium orange. So it's a really nice way to shift the colors. We're gonna go with that cadmium red deep just at the bottom of the candle here. And again, focus on the horizontal blending, not, uh, not the vertical blending, because you're gonna bring your tones up too high. Now I'm gonna mix some of that cadmium deep into the red. This is a great way to use one of your old brushes that maybe the bristles are getting a little old and you're almost ready to throw out your brush. And uh, cause we're doing a lot of scratching and scrubbing and see how busted up this old brush is, but uh, it's still really good for that scrubbing, pushing colors around. It's, uh, it's delicate days are over. Okay, um, something like that is going to be good for us. And let's bring that black up into the cadmium red a little bit more. This is one of those things that you can tinker with for quite a while. So, you know, at some point you just have to decide, oh, all right, I'll either come back to that uh, or I'll just leave it for now. Either leave it permanently or leave it for now. Uh, your choice. Let's do this top part of the candle now. Um, it's going to be a little bit tricky with the, the larger brush, so I am going to size down. Uh, you can if you like as well. Before you start with a new brush, I think it's always advisable to dip that brush in linseed oil or paint thinner just to make sure it is clean. Wipe it on a rag afterwards so you don't have too much excess. Um, so I have, oops, I'm just gonna wipe my hands here. Don't know where all that came from. My hands are covered, nice, classic. Um, yeah, okay, and um, yeah, I'm just going with a, I don't know what kind of brush this is. It's number four, round. It's like I just washed my hands with linseed oil. I don't know where it's coming from. It's like the... It's bizarre, look at that. Day at the beach. Um, this little part up here, remember, because it's behind, it has to be darker than the lip of this candle, which isn't gonna be a problem because that's the lightest color we use so far. I wanna keep it fairly light though, so we're gonna go with, I think cadmium, orange. Let me just pull a little bit of this cad red light. It's because I'm worried about it being too close. Um, and it looks to be all the same color. So let's see. Try not to destroy that lip 
that you painted there. A lip of the candle. Reload when you have to. Remember that orange is going to be picking up some of that black. The, uh, the principle of painting a candle is exactly the same as the principle of painting clothing and uh, or even the face, something like that. And that is that the brain, our brains want to interpret a single object as having a single color. But when we make an object have different colors, the brain said, instead of just saying, oh, that object has different colors, it wants to say, it's the same color, and why is it? Oh, it must be a light source, or it must be bending in space, or it creates all these different uh, illusions, and uh, just in order to trick itself. So that's, you know, that's, that's what painting is, is taking advantage of the way the brain thinks about objects in space uh, and under different lighting conditions. And so most of that is about knowing what the brain does. How does it interpret different objects and different shapes? Well, typically, if the object is of a lower saturation level, it's further back. If the object is a lower value or darker, it's further back. If the object has very clean lines, hard edges, it's closer to us. Soft edges are further back. Detail is closer. Generalized shapes are further back. There are all these different rules. That once you get the hang of them, um, you know you can use them to your advantage to create uh, really quite convincing illusions, I would say. Now this area here uh, on this, this second bump right here is quite bright as you can see in the reference image and that's because it's, you know, it's directly facing a light source. So I'm gonna pull some of that cadmium yellow really thick. You can see going for a good chunk of it And I'm just going to place it down there and then very carefully move it around until I'm satisfied that I have the right level of uh, value. I can pull some of it off too if I've put too much on, but uh, I do want it to be quite thick. Now there's another small line right in front of the flame that's gonna get the same treatment. Cadmium yellow, straight, straight up. And it's gonna be a small line just across. I didn't have the right brush for it, but uh, I should have used um, an angled brush. That's okay. Sometimes you kind of have to make do with what you have there. Um, and then you can pull some of that light off, put it on here. Uh, I am gonna add this little line down the candle now, just to give the illusion of uh, or an indic not an illusion, but an indication of roundness. Let's try that. This isn't from the same light source. This is a different light source, something else in the room. And then just allowing the colors that you have already there to blend in. You can do that because all of the colors are analogous. 
um, that means that they're all on the same side of the color wheel. They're all on the, on the, they're all warm colors basically. Um, that's a good spot to leave the candle. You can tinker with it and uh, you can make your blends smoother if you want. But uh, this as a demonstration, I think that's a wonderful spot to leave the candle. Let's move over to the flame now. And let me just tell you what I have in mind for the flame before we do it, just so you know where I'm going. The flame is broken up into three parts. The bottom part is basically the part around the wick and then a little bit above the wick. It's typically the darkest part of the flame. As you can see here, where the wick is, you have uh, that same dark plus black, um, sorry, black plus red that we saw at the bottom of the candle, and then into reds, and then very quickly into oranges and yellows, transitioning finally to white. The second part of the, of the flame is the white, and it's typically about half of the flame starting a quarter of the way up and going to a, qu a quarter of the way from the top. So the, the second and the third quarters are just white. You might sometimes get uh, an outline of a different color, like a bright yellow, but generally speaking, there's a lot of white in the center part. And then the third part of the flame is right at the top and it starts to get darker again. It starts to go through that whole um, same pattern, white to yellow to orange, and then finally to red and to red black and then black or a background. So you see uh, a gradient from the bottom to white and then the reverse gradient is white. It's, it's the same one, but starting with white and then all the way back to black. So that's what we're gonna go with here. We're gonna start right in the middle at the bottom with our darkest, and we can use our small brush again. The one that we're just using for the cadmium yellow. And this color is going to be black. Right at the, bo at, at the bottom. And a little bit of red. So you have black, red. You know, you, you can worry about the, uh, the wick later. We're gonna put it in later. I'm just focusing on our transitions at the moment. So you're pulling that red and the black and then very quickly getting into uh, oranges. Oh, I'm going to go, uh, let me see, before the oranges, I'm going to go for some of that red light and then into the oranges. You can go a little bit thicker here if you want because you can always pull it off. You're just going for the, for there's a certain blend where it's black, red, into red, into orange, into yellow. And you notice that most of the color is confined to the middle and uh, the white extends, it's like a uh, upside down U shape. And uh, yellow. There's that upside down U shape. And then it's a matter of just blending the oranges and the yellows together until you're, you're happy with, with your blends. Because of the, because you are painting a gradient, you can't skip any colors. The yellow has to touch the orange. The yellow can't touch the red. You know, it has to be the orange between. And, um, and then same thing, the orange has to go white, yellow, orange, red, black, or not quite black, but near, near black. So 
This orange comes down, starts to bend around the bottom. Now, um, we can stop here and put in the wick if you like. It's probably uh, a good, a good uh, place to stop and, and do the wick. So for the wick, uh, we're going to be using the same colors as the flame colors. You're just going to interrupt that darker area with something lighter. So if you have, um, if your darker area is mostly black, you can go with an orange, but mine is more on the orange and red side. So I'm going to have to go with this lighter orange here. Um, the wick is just two lines and a curved, uh, curving down and that's less is more when it comes to this part. Two lines curving down, pick up a lot of the black that's already there and I've even done too much there. I'm going to have to cover up some of that. I want it to almost disappear between the flame and the candle. So you can see a little bit of it on the candle and then it's brightest inside the flame. That's the idea. Okay, um, do we go with the, let's go with uh, the top of the candle and then we'll do the white afterwards. So just uh, since we have all of these colors already um, that we're working with, let me just get a little bit more of this uh, yellow here just so that the transition to white isn't gonna be quite so difficult. Okay, so we have yellow first and then orange. And again, this is an upside down U shape. Same shape as at the bottom of the candle. Yellow and then two yellow orange or orange. Maybe one of these lessons, I'll show you how to paint smoke. That's uh, really satisfying when you get um, when you when you paint smoke, and it looks very realistic with um, almost no effort. Really, it just kind of comes together. Um, you have to use zinc white, which is the transparent white, but it looks really nice when uh, when it happens. So we have the uh, the orange, and now I'm going to go with red and black just a little bit at the very top, just to help that flame fade. Okay. Now for the, oh, I'll just give you a second. Let's see wherever you are. This, uh, the middle part is going to be white and you're going to use a lot of white. I'm going to use a student grade white here. This is this is a Winsor Newton brand student grade titanium white. It's called Winton is their student grade brand. Um, you can, it's quite inexpensive. Like, uh, you know, you get a large 200 milliliter, uh, almost seven uh, US fluid ounce tube of this for about $10 Canadian. So about $7 US. Six or seven pounds if you're in the UK. So quite inexpensive. Before we move to the white, do clean your brush. Dip it in the linseed oil or your paint thinners, whatever you're using. I'm using linseed oil. Just because I don't have a fan running and I don't have any windows open and I typically don't paint uh, with thinner very much at all anyway. And uh, this is going to go on really thick because it's white and we want to keep it white 
as soon as this white mixes with whatever black is left, it's going to go gray. We don't want that. So we're going to counterbalance the that effect by really um, going with thick white and making sure that we're, we're uh, lo reloading our brushes regularly. This is titanium white. I'm just going to fill in as much as I can first and then I'll blend afterwards. So I'll paint right up to the line, but I'm not going to blend yet. I want I want to keep the white as white as possible and do my blending right at the very end. I hope you're all still with me. If you're not, uh, please do remember that I will be posting this immediately afterwards. So you can go back and you can pause and uh, you know paint at your own pace. I know as a beginner, it's quite difficult. You don't have the same access I have to the reference image. Um, and also this may be your first candle you've ever painted. So it can be challenging. If your painting is, isn't uh, tied down in a certain orientation, I do recommend flipping your painting to do the other edge. It's always easiest to do an outside edge. So if you have access to that, to flipping your, your painting, please do. It's good practice. Okay, I'm very close to the point where I'm going to start blending this white with the other colors. So I'll just get into that now. I'm going to use something called a mall stick. Mine happens to be a selfie stick, but I just, it's a telescopic extension. And I hook it on the end of my easel, and then I can rest my hand uh, on the selfie stick. Oh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming, Tenley. I know this was your uh, recommendation. Yeah, I'm. Uh, that's bizarre that uh, it didn't show up until 20 minutes in. I, uh, I think I got started around... I was very close to seven, so. But uh, yeah, sorry, sorry that uh, I did that. I did that to you before too, so. That's uh, unfortunate. But um, yeah, it's. This one's almost. We're just over an hour now, so. Um, I don't think it's going to be too much longer. We're just doing some blending now, of this lightest. This is titanium white. can bring some of that white all the way down. I'm uh, mixing the white with the other colors. And the only color it should be touching is that is the lightest color, that yellow. But depending on, on uh, how much care you took, you may be mixing it with the oranges and the reds as well. That's okay. And um, I'm thinking now I probably should have wiped off a lot more of the black because I am getting a good deal of gray here, but uh, that's okay um, on the next one. Yeah, sorry about the, the live not showing up. Hopefully it uh, it can work for you the next time. And 
uh, yeah, I'm just blending in the edges now with that white. So you can see what I what I mean when I was talking about the three different sides uh, or three different areas of a candle. The uh, the bottom quarter and then the middle half and then the top quarter. It's going quite thick here with this white. It's, uh, I'm just trying to overpower the gray and the black that's left by using more white. White, of course, is the, has the highest tinting strength. Titanium white, anyway, has the highest tinting strength and is the most opaque of all of the paints. So it can be a powerful ally. Of course, the opposite is true as well. It can be very hard to deal with if you don't. If you if you let it get away from you. Like this little area here. And then I'm just going to blend in. I've just wiped my brush now. I'm going to blend in some of these other colors together. To create a bit of a smoother transition here. And then I'm going to make this a little bit lighter. I'll just bring it down. I painted it too high, I think. So you saw in today's painting class, uh, when painting a candle, a couple of different things at play, but mostly it's this idea of transitions. And uh, we used a singular color palette. We used a palette that involved red and orange and yellow. A warm analogous color palette is what you'd call it. And uh, we divided the painting up into two different sections the flame and the candle. After doing the candle first, we did a horizontal blend down with about four different colors. Um, and then after that, moved over to the flame and used the same blend, but did a reverse blend as well. So using the same colors going from red black to red to orange, to orange yellow, to yellow, to white, and then use that same order, just reversed it at the very top of the scale. So a couple of different, um, a couple of different ideas at play here. My brush is old, so I keep scratching into my uh, paint. That's what's happening here, why I'm doing so much blending. I keep, I keep uh, scratching into it. Okay, uh, let me just move my camera up a little bit because I'm getting quite a lot of glare and maybe be able to get a better view of this. Um, so 
So that's, you know, I could do some more refining um, and make these blends a little smoother, but uh, but that's pretty much it. That's that's the general idea. I think there's definitely enough there that you ha can now go on your own and and uh, and try it out. See how it works for yourself. If you uh, if you weren't able to paint it in real time, I think there is. Um, I think there's still enough there that you can try it now. This was a little bit of a shorter one, but. I don't think any less fun. It's always a, a really cool idea to paint new and interesting things and things that seem quite challenging. And you know, candles certainly do seem challenging because they have a completely different light source. They are themselves, of course, a light source. So uh, that being said, I really hope that you enjoyed this painting class and I'm looking forward to doing the next one. I don't know what it's going to be yet. But um, let me just take these last few moments. Thank you, thank you, uh, Kate, thank you, Adam. Let me just take these last few moments to plug my Patreon. For those of you who aren't uh, patrons, um, please know that patreon.com slash Mark Liam Smith. I have a bunch of exclusive content. I have discounts on all everything in my store, including uh, all of my prints in my store, uh, phone, phone cases, pillowcases, and more. I have digital downloads like coloring pages and phone wallpapers that I send you uh, every every month. Um, uh, thank you, thank you both. And, uh, and then I also have other things, like I have a print club where I send you out a print every month and some other things. So if you are interested, please do check out my Patreon. Uh, that is uh, one way to support me and I, uh, and I really appreciate that. Other ways you could support me, I do have um, uh, prints available in my store and uh, starting at about $25. So if you want some of my art on your walls, that's a relatively inexpensive way to do it. And uh, all of that being said, uh, that's it. I do go live on Tuesdays and Fridays on TikTok. And usually I paint on, on my paintings, which in this case is this large uh, still life painting that I'm working on here and I've been working on for quite a while now. We'll be doing that live on TikTok, but uh, if I don't see you on TikTok on Tuesday and Friday from 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, then I will see you back here next Sunday starting at 7 p.m. Thank you very much. I am Mark Liam Smith, and it's been fun painting with you.